Hi everybody. Welcome to the multilingual content in D8 session, a highly evolved permutated API. So my name, uh, can you hear me? My name is Francesco Placella, my DO name is Plach, and I'm from Venice, Italy. Um, I work as senior performance engineer at Taguan Consulting. I've been working on Drupal stuff since 2006. And at the moment, I'm the maintainer of the core uh, language system and the core translation module, and also the contrib entity translation and title modules. You can see below my Twitter handle. Uh, uh, watch out, it has two underscores at the end. Not, not sure if you can see them. So a brief outline of what we will cover during this session. Uh, we will start with a brief introduction, uh, a brief history, if you want, uh, on the Drupal 7 API, because uh, it has some, it has quite some drawbacks, and it's needed to explain how we improved it. Then we will turn to an overview of what we done in D8 uh, on the entity API level, because that was needed to work on multilingual content. Then we will have a brief look to the content translation UI. Uh, Gabor is at, uh, presenting a session, a lab, where he is showcasing all the multilingual goodies we implemented. But I will give you just a, a, a small preview since I've been working on that for a long time. Then we will see all the entity storage and querying stuff that we've been building to support all multilingual content needs. And finally, we will have a look to the how, how it's built the new entity translation API, because we have one, <laughs> finally. And then we will summarize uh, what is left since, hey, we're just in beta. Okay, let's start with some uh, l with a look on the current D7 stuff we have. Okay, I uh, bet most of you, if if you are here, are familiar with the the first line, which is which shows how uh, looks like the typical uh, field data structure on an entity, and you can see the usual field name, the infamous lang code level, and then the usual delta and columns levels. This one is the piece that is causing troubles, as you all know, because it's hard to predict uh, what sh we should be put here to access the, the proper data. In fact, uh, a field may be translatable or not, and so this means that that language, lang code variable may be uh, an actual language, lang code, or uh, the language, uh, the and lang code, or better, uh, the language non constant. In the case the, the field is not translatable, this means we have to check every time for field translatability, as you well know. Then, what we implemented in the field API, we uh, to deal with language, uh, we we actually. Uh, took two different approaches depending on the context. When we have to uh, work uh, with storage, we act on all languages. So we are able to load and store all the available translation, field translation at once. Instead, when um, working with forms or rendering entities, we are dealing with a language at a time. All this architecture provides a good consistency because uh, uh, exactly as cardinality and delta values, language is always there and is predictable. Uh, the data structure is predictable, but as we will, uh, we well know, it provides a, a very bad DX for the reason I just explained. So you probably well know what I'm talking about. Then we have the entity language API in D7, or something like that. Actually, we have an, an incomplete entity API in core. In fact, most of it is in contrib. Uh, the, the small pieces we have in core include the entity language function, which, uh, as the name 
uh, tells uh, has the role to return the, the language of the entity. And then we have a couple of functions, useful functions, in the entity API module. The, um, when you use the entity metadata wrapper, I uh, hope you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's just like, uh, how many do know what uh, the entity metadata wrapper is? Okay, many of you are wonderful. So yet I don't have to explain, which <laughs> would be difficult. Um, so when you ha want to, to work with language, you have to, with translation, you have to specify the language you want to access before, and you have to call that language method. Or you can call the get translation method on an entity object directly. Um, both of those methods are provided by a contrib module I'd like to outline. Then we have uh, the entity translation module that instead provides three hooks related to CRUD operations that are fired when translation are inserted, updated, and deleted. So as you can see, this is hardly an API. It's spread in three places and it has very inconsistent naming patterns and uh, DX. This is a big trouble for all uh, the people needing to uh, write multilingual code in D7. Our, uh, our content translation models in D7 uh, are the following. We have actually two competing approaches because we have no translation in core that lets you create a different node uh, and uh, lets you assign a, a language to each one and basically uh, you, you can uh, put them together in a single translation set. And then we have at API level the field translation so you, you are able to, as we, see, as we saw, we are able to provide a different translation for each field if fields are, are translatable and we have just a core API but uh, the UI is provided by the entity translation module. Uh, so in the eight, uh, we we decided that two uh, two approaches were too much. Actually, uh, the main reason for not having two approaches is that uh, yeah, site builders have to uh, choose one and we don't want to confuse people and make them ask questions if they don't strictly need to. Developers have to support both because most of the time uh, the code needed to support one or the another is different. And everyone has to understand both. So these, all of these implies an increase in cognitive burden and, and also operative and maintenance burden because you have to write more code and more, um, above all, you have to maintain more code. So uh, after a very, very long discussion, a huge debate during the uh, very early phases of the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative, uh, we came up with a uh, solution that is an unifi unified model. Actually, what we want is translate every piece of content uh, applied applied, sorry, to an entity. So um, basically, we are merging the two approaches. Actually, we are uh, a field for each piece of data attached to an entity, and but we have a single entity for each translation set. So actually, we are able to vary each single uh, piece of data attached to an entity per language. Yes, uh, one thing uh, I forgot before uh, going to the next slide. Uh, one of our main contributors, Jose Reyero, is not exactly a fan of this solution. So uh, he was um, proposing to revive it in Contrib, the, to revive the old solution in Contrib. And we tried hard to make that possible. So he will probably experiment with a, a translation module uh, providing um, the old behavior because actually there might be use cases where the old behavior is better fit. We will cover this in a bit more detail later. So uh, what's new in the Drupal 8 Entity API? Sorry, I, can, I cannot find the right <laughs> So uh, what's new in the, the 8 Entity API? Uh, we have classed objects 
and that allows us to encapsulate all the data and all the processing logic of data. We have interfaces and swappable implementations, which, which means that actually we are able to provide a different class uh, for the node entity, for instance, and this can be useful. And the interface on top of that allows us to easily swap it. We have more swappable handlers, what we use to call controllers in Drupal 7. So basically we are uh, different handlers for storage, which is the only one available in Drupal 7, sorry. We have handlers for form. So basically we have uh, a handler responsible for generating entity forms and then single entity types are able to extend this handler and provide customization just for their use cases. We have, a, with the similar approach, we have translation handler, which is in charge of altering the entity form and providing all the UI for translation. The render uh, handler, which is responsible in the very same way uh, to uh, provide a renderable, a renderable array for the entity, and, it, and that can be customized for every entity type. And then we have uh, other handlers, like the access control handler, which behaves exactly the same way. These, all of these as, are very useful because allow to generalize uh, all the common logic and just uh, provide a very small customization for single entity types. And this is very powerful because allows us to unify most of the entity, of the various entity behaviors. Then we have uh, uh, f maybe the most important piece, uh, which is the Entity Field API, basically. This is a, an extended and improved version on the, of the Entity Property API we had in D7, and it allows to provide definitions for each field that is attached to an entity, and is the uh, only way, actually, to define fields. Both, um, it's a unified way to deal with fields and this means that what in Drupal 7 we were used to call properties like the node title are now fields. And what in Drupal 7s we were used to call fields are fields again. So everything is a field. Just what is provided by the field API are configurable fields. That just means that the definitions are provided based on the configuration the, the user uh, enters through the field UI. Um, this is very important because it can provide uh, a way to the entity system to know my, uh, a lot of things about every single piece of data it handles. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, we have that all field definitions are based on ta the tape data API, which is another lower level and allows to uh, provide data for sorry, uh, allows to um, know which native data uh, are assigned to each field, which is very powerful to build stuff like rules or something like that. And it works with any piece of data attached to any entity. So uh, now uh, a small demo of what we build. Uh, the content translation uh, UI, a uh, small interaction. The content translation UI. Basically, uh, co with content, we mean uh, content entity. That means that uh, any entity extended the content, uh, content entity interface is supported. And we will see in a moment how many content entities we are able to translate with it just in core. It uh, exploits the form handler's co concept I was uh, referring to before. And uh, it um, has column granularity when we talk about translatability, which means that we can uh, define uh, what elements are translatable even uh, at, le at even lower level than fill, because we are able, for instance, in an image to tell whether uh, the file property should be translatable or not, or whether the alt or title properties are translatable or not. And yes, let's have a look. So as I was mentioning, this is our content translation configuration page. So basically what you can see listed there is the, the list of all the content 
entity types that we support in core, and we have content, the usual nodes, and when we click on that, we have another way to configure in just a couple of clicks the translatability for all field, all available fields. And as I was mentioning, you, we can say that the file, for instance, is shared among all translations, but all the titles are translatable. Save. As, as you may have noticed, we have taxonomy terms here, custom menu links here, custom blocks here, comments, and users, which means that any of these entity types is fully translatable now in core. Applause, please. <laughs> So let's have a look of how this works. Sorry, a small screen. We created an article, for instance. And here is the usual uh, translation overview page. We can provide another translation, as usual. Here we have some options. For the node, we don't have very much because most is covered already. And, and here it is. And then, finally, we create a third language and we have the usual source language select. <coughs> here it is, and we can create an, another, yet another translation. So, yes. Here's the translation status, it's our language, and then we can delete a translation if you don't want to be there. And this works the very same way with, for instance, taxonomy terms. The name is completely random. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit difficult from this distance. And here it is, we have the very same UI for terms. So I won't spend much time on this. Gabor is doing a fantastic work, he's showcasing this stuff, but yeah, I wanted to show it just a bit. And here it is. Sorry, forgot to enable the language switcher, I think. Oh, it's not showing it. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, let's go on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just a suggestion. So let's talk about entity storage. 
what makes everything possible is the ability of storing uh, multilingual values. It may, be, it may sound obvious, but it wasn't re exactly easy to achieve. So how we decided to, to achieve this? Basically, in D7, we had just one single solution, which is the title module that allows to replace somehow with doing very funky stuff, somehow replacing uh, entity labels and uh, s uh, relying on field translation uh, allows to more or less translate uh, the full entity. But there are all the other base properties that are out of luck. And we are able to at, at achieve at least this result because Drupal 7 fields have native, native multilingual storage. So once we decided that this was the way we wanted to, to go through, we, it was obvious that we had to provide um, native multilingual storage or also for base field. And the, the, um, the right moment to implement this stuff came when we uh, spoke with the Entity API folks that uh, told us that they wanted to provide a really cool feature in the 8, which was uh, storage and agnostic entities, which means that uh, we are able to swap entirely the storage uh, for the whole entity, while, uh, whereas in Drupal 7, we are able to do that just for single fields. And since we, to achieve that, we are forced to build our code without making assumption, assumptions on the storage, we are also able to make no assumptions on the SQL storage or the table layouts we are adopt. So we basically uh, were uh, allowed to revamp how the uh, default core uh, table layout is structured so that it supports uh, multilingual natively. Sorry, I uh, went a bit ahead. Here it is. So, um, th this approach um, implies that we need to load entities every time we want to access their data. And when we want to qu query entities, we don't go through uh, directly accessing the database because this wouldn't work as soon as we swap a NoSQL storage, for instance. And instead, we use the entity query. We should be familiar, uh, you should be familiar with the entity query concept because it, it's already there in D7. It's called entity field query. And uh, Chicks provided and Boyans provided a, a revamped version, the two version, the version two which is called just entity query and allow it's way more pow powerful and expressive and allows to write m many queries that are comparable with the, the SQL ones because it supports um, join, more or less joins and aggregations. When I say it supports joins, I mean that it has a syntax to express relations between entity types. So basically you are able, uh, the, the, um, the SQL implementation, the SQL backend of the entity query system is able to translate these relationships into actual joins. And for instance, a, a Mongo a storage would do completely different things. But the, the point is, is we are not forced to uh, skip joins now because entity query, the entity query SQL backend allows for them. And uh, the, the, um, the very important point is that the entity, SQL backend, entity query SQL backend we have in core supports all the, multi, all the multilingual stuff we baked into storage. And this is actually what allows us to work uh, transparently with any uh, table layout, actually. So let, let's have a look to an example of how querying multilingual querying works. Uh, uh, can you see uh, even you at the bottom, the code, or is it too small? Is it fine? Okay. So um, basically, the Entity Query API make, makes no assumption on the language conditions. Uh, so uh, when, you, when you perform this first query, um, you, you basically are getting simply all the um, the nodes that are uh, published and promoted. 
and this is true uh, if, uh, for any translation, okay? So uh, this returns any node that has at least uh, at one published or promote and promoted, sorry, translation. As you can see, the syntax is very similar to the BTNG and the DX is very, is very similar. So we had big improvements as, on this side. So writing entity queries is much more similar and much, much easier than in D7. Uh, another example, uh, this language condition is explicit and allows you to retrieve old nodes that has an English promoted translation, as you can see. And there's also a, a way to say, I don't know which is the original language of the entity, but, uh, but I, I want my condition to apply to that language, which is default LAN code. Uh, this way, we are retrieving all the nodes with the promote original values, okay? So, uh, 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 be, uh, some more details on how the core SQL storage works. Basically, um, what we now call bundle fields, which are fields that are somehow optional in the sense that they can be attached to some bundles but not some others, uh, are still, uh, still have uh, per field tables, which is uh, the usual, usual field tables we are used to see in Drupal 7. And they still have, obviously, multilingual support. What we have now, is uh, four different table layouts depending on the properties of the entity type. Which, uh, what does this mean? Uh, basically, uh, an entity type can be revisionable or not, and can be translatable or not. And this uh, provides us four combinations. Uh, so uh, we have four different table layouts possible. We have a base table, we have a revision table, we have a base field data table, which means that basically all the information, field information is stored in this data table, which holds the last revision. And a field revision data table, uh, which instead holds all the available revision. You can think to the last two uh, um, tables like, um, uh, um, merging all the single field data tables, okay? There's the same relationship. They were uh, modeled on the concept of uh, field table, field data table, and field revision table, but they, they can uh, store multiple field values. That's the only difference. So uh, these are the full implemented, uh, the four uh, provided tables, and uh, we, you can have different combinations depending on the properties. So uh, a, a basic entity type would have only the base table, uh, uh, like I don't know the taxonomy term in Drupal 7. A uh, revisionable entity type might have only the base and revision tables, like I don't know the commerce order entity type in Drupal 7. A uh, translatable entity type, not revisionable, would get only the base field data table or data table uh, where we would store all the translation. And instead, the, 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 uh, the base table would hold only the very basic stuff like UUID and bundle and stuff like that. And uh, instead, nodes that in core, in Drupal 8 core, are both revisionable and translatable, get the more complex table layout, which has all the four tables. And actually, uh, uh, what we have is that uh, the base table, uh, as I told you, holds only UUID and minimal stuff is basically used to allocate uh, the uh, entity ID. Revision table, the same, holds just most, mostly only the revision metadata and uh, the revision ID, and all the actual field data is uh, stored in the field data table and in the field revision table, uh, which is uh, uh, very cool because we, we are actually have, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't tell you one thing, also untranslatable fields are stored here, so actually we can use the data table as a uh, denormalization de table and perform querying only on this table. We uh, we very seldom need to join the other ones when, when querying, okay? So in, in, uh, even if we have four tables, we are actually able to, to query just one single table. Nonetheless, these uh, new table layout obviously imply a performance penalty for mon monolingual site, which 
don't, don't need such, a, such complexity. Because uh, when querying, we, we might, anyway, need some additional joins. Let's say when, you want, when we want to query on the UUID. And uh, we have composite primary keys, uh, which make queries lower. And then on saving, obviously, we have more records to store. So this is, uh, this is lower. Uh, we tried hard to mitigate this factor, and we came up with a really cool solution, I think, because uh, basically what we came up with is generating the schema based on the entity type properties. So actually, you don't need to provide your entity type schema in your install file anymore. All the, the entity storage takes care of that, which makes sense if you think about it, because a Mongo storage doesn't need a SQL table. And actually, you just need to provide the definition for your entity type. And the storage will create tables for you with the proper table layout, so you don't have to understand the very little details. You just define your entity type, and it works. And we recently also implemented uh, um, a system that is capable of updating this schema based on changes on entity type and field definitions. And I will show you uh, an example in a moment. This provides also uh, an improvement, a performance improvement over D7 because uh, we are able to skip field revision tables when the entity type is not revisionable. And this saves a lot of uh, stores, say records are not stored when they are not needed. Let me show you, Let me show you a, another example. So I basically um, re wrote a very small module to just perform a couple of alteration on the entity type and entity and entity field definitions. It's just an example module. It does very simple things. Basically, what we want to show it, actually I was using to try other stuff, so I will uncomment just a couple of rows. So what I'm doing here, I'm adding a new field definition to, know, to the node entity type, and I'm changing the cardinality of the node title from single value to multiple values. So let me show you how the database look like right now before applying these changes. This is, sorry. This is our regular base table. As you can see, it holds almost nothing. And this is our data table. I will probably need to delete this node because changes, schema changes are not allowed when data is already created uh, as for field data. We will talk about that later. So let's delete that. So as you can see, here we, ha we have our usual regular title column. Now, I'm going to clear caches so the system knows uh, something has changed. Let's change it. OK, and then visit status report. It's now telling me that we have updates because the schema is up to date. Is up to date. We perform these updates, and it's telling we have to create the text field and we have to update the title field. We apply these changes. We go online. I wouldn't go online in this shape, actually, but 
you will see why in a, in a moment. And this is what happens. No title, it, it's a separate table. <laughs> You're a smart audience, you're starting to know how it works, actually. I had the upload uh, slide right next, but you, you anticipated me. <laughs> okay, um, so let me show you that this just works. It's funny, actually. Here it is. <laughs> Can you see it? We have two titles now. So basically, this is just a way to show you that uh, with this uh, system, we are able to switch from, I don't know, uh, a, non -tra a translatable node type. Uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, let's imagine a node the node entity type and the site where you are pretty sure multilingual will never be enabled. You can just, in a one line of code, alter the entity type definition strip out the translatable bit or set it to false, run the updates and you get the regular storage you, you were used to in Drupal 7 and no penalty uh, happens anymore. If you want. <laughs> okay, let's go on. So a brief note about views. A brief note about views. Actually, uh, Views uh, is more or less working with all of this, although it's not able yet to uh, adapt to the changes in the table layout. We are working on that. It shouldn't be too hard, but because right now we have these uh, new uh, entity data views, uh, uh, sorry, entity views data handler, which is able to, uh, to uh, expose all views data automatically for any entity type all the base definition all the base code and all the base definitions are implemented for any entity type and then can be customized as usual for specific entity types and actually uh, these allow these provides the foundations for um, um, uh, letting views uh, adapt to any change in the table layout but we are not there yet we still um, we are listing when the uh, entity type is translatable, the records in the d data table, as I, were, as I was mentioning before. And this uh, may cause uh, some duplic duplication issues because um, all the translations are listed, so you, you need to have a filter on the translation language, which uh, basically provides you only the translations for the current la language, let's say. It's, it's rather easy, but we need to adapt. We still need to update the default uh, views provided with core, and we still uh, need to implement uh, some handlers to make everything work smoothly, but we are working on that. So don't be scared if you see views not working properly with multilingual. Right now, we have a meta issue, thanks to J Jennifer Hogdon, which is doing a great work with that, and you can help her uh, during the sprint if you want to. Okay, let's uh, turn to the a API side. Uh, a brief note on language assignment. Uh, um, we implemented all, um, a system that allows us to define um, uh, some configuration to provide the default language that should be assigned to entities uh, when creating them. And this uh, configuration is used to determine um, the default uh, selected in the um, entity forms. It's, and it's also used to um, provide the default when uh, entities are created programmatically. So this is consistent. Once, uh, once uh, we are able to implement also the uh, language widget, which are working on, uh, we are actually able to uh, really unify all the logic uh, of uh, language assignment for any entity type, which is very cool because it can be a bit tricky. And no one has to worry about that. You just have to define uh, a, field, a language field, and then everything will, will just work because the form will be, will know how to handle it. Just a quick note about that. 
So the Entity Translation API, this is the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, in, as we saw in Drupal 7, we have no nothing like an Entity Translation API. We have just a bunch of functions and hooks and so on, but they do, do not work as we need. Actually, uh, we came up with, a, I think, a very good solution that improves the, uh, the actual working with multilingual entities very much in Drupal 8. The main idea was provided by, by Krell, and uh, a, big, uh, a big credit goes to him. Basically, as you can see the, uh, in the code snippet, what we are doing is uh, retrieving a, a, a translation object, which is exactly uh, a clone as of the original entity object, but with a, a different internal language, which means that we are able to access fields in a different language, the languages we specified. As you can see, the first line retrieves the, um, the original value, then we get the translation object, and then the same, exactly the same code provides uh, a translated value, which is very nice because uh, the, um, the API um, transparently handles, handles field translatability. You don't have to worry whether the field is translatable or not. You don't have line code level to specify. All is internal. It's still there, but is internal, and you don't have to worry about that. And we also implemented uh, native hooks, and we have uh, unified and streamlined all the existing APIs as we can, as we will see in a moment. And you can find more information about this at that URL, which is the change notice about the, the stuff. It provides some examples uh, and covers may, maybe covers something we will not talk about uh, right now. How do we access uh, field data? Actually, as you can see in D7, we used to perform all this funky stuff because we needed the field definition. We needed to uh, check whether the, the field was translatable or not. And then finally, after determining which is the, la the active language, uh, I mean the language we are curr currently working on, um, we, we were able to access a field value. This is really not viable. In the eight, we have a, a way simpler code, as you, as you can see. We just get the translation corresponding to the active language and access the value, and that's it. Um, one note about active language. The active language might not exist. We might not have a translation for that language, so we implemented another system to uh, deal with that. Okay, another example of this stuff. Uh, I will talk about the active language, I will how to determine the active language in a moment. Uh, and, and a few more words on this concept. Actually, as you can see, the, this was the problematic code because you had to check the translatability of a field. And basically, you have to determine the active language if no language was provided, okay? You, this was a typical pattern. You defaulted to the con current la content language. And then you were finally able to do the stuff you had to do with that data. What we are able to do in the eight is a completely different uh, approach yeah. and it's way nicer if you want, because you let's say you retrieve the current language, but it doesn't matter which act, actual active language you use. You retrieve a translation for that language, and then you just call the, the function with the entity object. And the function can be written as if it were, uh, were passed a regular entity object. If it needs language, it can just access it through the language uh, method. If it doesn't, it can be written as a language agnostic piece of code. You don't need all that funky stuff we had before earlier. This one. This one is not needed anymore, as you can see, which is very nice. So, as I was telling you, you may need to det determine the active language, okay? This was typically the way we did that in D7. This is not exactly ideal because uh, field language performs field language fallback, which means that if a field value is not defined for a particular field, we fall back to another language. The problem is that this was originally intended to work with all field values together. 
because it was a way to provide uh, fallback to the, an entire entity translation, but we had no entity translation concept in D7. So the side effect was if just a single field was missing, you get just that field in, in a different language, which can, could be very confusing. Uh, in D8, we revamped completely all these stuff and basically uh, provided this single method that uh, performs entity language negotiation, which means that internally the, the entity manager uh, figures out which is the best, uh, most appropriate translation for the context it's best and returns the translation. So let's say we ask uh, a la the current language, but we have no translation for the current language. Uh, the entity manager will check out, will apply some logic, which is swappable and modules can alter it. And based on the context it's provided, it may decide that another language is appropriate and return it. So we still have a translation object to work on. And the important, another important thing is that if you have an, emp if you have an empty value, uh, an empty field in a particular language, you don't get that in another language when displaying or working with the entity, which could be very problematic. Uh, this is the context I was referring to. Let's imagine we, have, uh, we, are, implemented, uh, we are implementing the, some code dealing with tokens. Uh, and we have no line code specified in the options. We can default uh, to this value, which just tells the system to default to the original language. And then we specify this context here. When we do that, we are actually providing more information to all the fallback system that actually can uh, forward this information to the hook implementations that can use it to decide whether a different logic is, needs to be applied in, let's say, when creating tokens. If no default context is provided, the entity view context is assumed. This is a random string. You can provide any string that makes sense to you. And the entity view uh, context just uh, tries to return the, the current language and fall back to the uh, the next language uh, using language weights as configured in the language configuration UI. And this works natively uh, fine with uh, view builders that display the current language and form handlers that edit the uh, current language, uh, the current version of the, the translation. Another couple of, of, uh, of examples. Uh, when you are dealing with translatable fields, untr sorry, untranslatable fields, uh, even if we create uh, different objects, the values are shared through, and, uh, through references. So if we alter a, a value for an untranslatable field on the entity object and then we do it again on the translation object, the, the values actually uh, change, as you can see. We, we set bar here and then entity field untranslatable as a value bar. You just need to be careful and not ser serialize these objects, otherwise the field refer the references, internal references will be lost and this won't work anymore, but this is not a common case. And so as, you, as I was saying, uh, the actual data values are shared among all the translation objects. This is the last example, I think. No, there, are one, there is one more. Uh, as you can see, we have an API to uh, retrieve the, the current language. So this method just returns the, the, the language associated with this translation object. And we can retrieve uh, the, an entity, uh, the original version, the untranslated version from any object, so translation get untranslated or entity or entity get untranslated would return the same object, as you can see here. And then this is the typical way to get the original language. You just retrieve the original translation object and retrieve its language, and that's all. And then you, you are able to iterate over all the exist available translations. You are able to check whether a translation exists, add a new one providing a few default values, which is the same of doing this, aside from the fact that if this code is not installed in the system, you will get an exception. And then, this is important, to avoid uh, breaking some code, 
that might try to act after a translation has been removed. Uh, when you call remove translation on an entity object, any translation object that was instantiated from it with the removed language code will throw an exception every time you try to access its field, so it's not possible to do, uh, let's say, try to update a value that then will be deleted, so we'll lose your data. Okay, I wanted to mention uh, uh, one thing. As I was saying before, Jose was not completely happy of, of this approach of having uh, a single uh, entity holding all translation, but uh, swappable uh, classes allows us to provide a different implementation of the class object. So it might even be able to keep the, the very same interface, the very same API, but the backend might be implemented with different uh, entity objects. So this is, I think, a, a good signal that the API, the API is well designed. And then we have two, just two store, uh, hooks, because when uh, translations are added or removed from the storage, we get these hooks. Uh, the update is not needed because uh, we just have our regular entity update hook. And this is a whole. Oh. So what is, mi what is missing, sorry? As I was telling you before, we are not able to uh, switch uh, table layouts dynamically yet because there are still a few R-coded uh, SQL queries in the storage handlers. So we are working on make those uh, uh, query the, the database dynamically so they are able to adapt to any table layout we support. And this includes work on, on the view side. Then we have uh, entity translation of casting, which is a very complex way to, to say that we are not loading yet the, the translation corresponding uh, to the current language when, when we um, are upcasting. So we are translating from a URL placeholder to the actual object. So let's say our usual node uh, one is uh, provides us uh, node one in the original language instead of uh, uh, taking uh, in a, into account the current language actually. So this is an easy change but we want to do it uh, as soon as possible because this way uh, uh, when you are working on a custom route, core routes already work with this stuff, but when you are implementing your custom routes, the, the object you will get when, uh, when retrieving the related attribute from the request will be already in the current language, so you won't, won't have to retrieve it. And then we have a few usability improvements for the content translation modules, which is not really in, the, in a good shape on that side because we had more basic stuff to work on. So these are all topics for the, the sprints, upcoming sprints, if you want to join us. And then a, a last slide. Uh, on the migration API, which as you know is now in core and that will probably allow us to um, uh, support also cases where we want to switch from, uh, we want to switch table layouts when we already created data. We just have to uh, integrate everything so that um, when we run a, a migration, uh, all the data is stored in the new tables. It, it will probably require some code, but I don't think so much. And then we have to write a migration to upgrade the, the old node-based translations and migrate all the field data. So this is something uh, that we can work on during the sprints also. A few more links for when you will download these uh, presentation slides. This is the celebration video, you have to watch it. I, I won't reveal anything about it. This is uh, the improvements meta issue for the content translation module. This is the Drupal 8 multilingual initiative official website which is run by Gabor in a fantastic way. And this, his, this is his uh, personal site with, where it, you can find a lot of useful information of our, on our progress. And again, remember to attend the Sprints Friday because we have all sorts of work to, for you, so you just, you just have to come. And that's it. I think that's uh, question, question time. So I want to answer actually the question that probably uh, most of you has been wondering when you came here because I won't tell you what is a permutated API actually, but you can discover it if you listen to the, 
this song, so I will <laughs> invite you to do so. And if you have questions, I'm it. Uh, I'm here, sorry. Okay, so thank you.